In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together under the principle of freedom so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the things that we note and give us the concentration necessary to to, uh, grow in grace and in knowledge and fulfill this unique spiritual life. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Open your Bibles to Matthew 27, verse 11. Matthew 27, verse 11. And I believe the last two messages were just now uploaded onto the Internet. No, they will be right after class, won't they? And Okay, (laughs) that wasn't a threat, I was just wondering. 2711. Then Jesus stood before Pilate, the procurator. Now we remember procurator. This is the lowest form of a governor because Judea was uh, considered by Rome the lowest uh, province. We got a nosebleeder. It's from singing too high. (laughs) And you can excuse yourself if you need to. And uh, he was the uh, procurator because uh, Judea is a poor province. And that's because they're under the uh, cycles of discipline. They're under the fourth cycle. They've already been through the third, which meant poverty. So it's uh, one of the poor provinces of the Roman Empire. And because of that, they put a procurator in charge of it. He's a third class type governor. But he's a good governor. And uh, he's he's brilliant, by the way. But he's got some problems. And his problem is weakness. He is very weak, and anyone in leadership cannot be weak and must stand for what is right and must uh, always stand by principle. Whenever you get this vacillation and you don't stand on principle, then your leadership is uh, not so great. And this current president had a wonderful chance to go down in history as one of the greatest presidents ever, but uh, because of uh, he has some of these problems too, but I guess I shouldn't say that about a fellow believer. But the thing is that uh, Pilate here does have this problem of wanting to uh, just get along with everyone, and as a leader that just doesn't happen. As a leader, you are going to make decisions, and when you make decisions, it's going to offend some people, and it's going to uh, make other people happy. But you can't have it, you can't make everybody happy all at once, not in a leadership position. But this is the pilot's predicament as a weak, uh, as a brilliant man, but weak in character. Then Jesus stood before Pilate the procurator, and the procurator asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, It is as you have said. In other words, affirmative. Yes, I am the king of the Jews. And uh, Pilate actually believes him because he he, uh, knows the lineage. And uh, Pilate sees nothing wrong with Jesus whatsoever. He's actually the first judge that has come along in this fourth trial. This is the fourth trial, by the way. And he's the first judge that is impartial. Remember, the other judge was going crazy, ripping off his clothes and making a big show and saying, uh, he is guilty, everyone say he's guilty, etc. But he is unbiased in the situation, and he knows that Jesus Christ is innocent of the charges, and he hates the religious crowd. He's not a believer, but he hates the religious crowd because he knows they're phony. And he knows how phony they are, and we'll see how the religious crowd bullies the procurator. Not directly. If uh, they would have went up to him directly, 
uh, to Pontius Pilate, if the religious crowd had went up to him directly and said, crucify Jesus, he would have bowed his neck because he didn't like those people. So they used a backdoor way, and that was using the mob. And they got a mob together, and then that was what caused Pilate to buckle. Buckled under the pressure of a mob. 27.12 But when he was accused by the chief priest and the elders, that's the religious crowd, he did not respond. So after he walked, what happened was he walked out of the temple on them. We remember that in the past. And when he did so, he separated himself from them both verbally and mentally. And uh, even though he's going to go to the cross and pay for their sins, he shuts up from then on. He's not going to say another word to this religious crowd. And that's because they've been given three years of the most lucid information that they could ever have concerning uh, that him being the Messiah. And they've received the best Bible teaching they're ever going to receive concerning the fact that he is the Messiah. They saw all the miracles they had. So Jesus Christ, uh, when he sees their vehement rejection, he simply phases them out both mentally and physically. And the, the point is, sometimes we have to do that with some people in our lives. And while it may be painful, it's just the way it has to be. And Jesus Christ was uh, strong, of course, and perfect in the unique spiritual life. And he knew that he had to phase out the religious people mentally and physically. He just separated. Wouldn't even, uh, they would accuse him and he just would not respond. And, of course, that made the religious crowd vibrate all the more. They're bullies, see? Religion always bullies people. And they always get into people's business. I've had some religious people actually go through my trash to see if they can find a beer bottle. Yeah, it's that kooky. And that's what religion does. Religion is always uh, looking to accuse caught the man. It's just a funny it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> He looked embarrassed and he's going through the trash like a what are those uh not homos, those the other hobos. Hobos going through the, going through the trash like a hobo looking for beer or anything else that uh, could uh something he didn't agree with that that's how far off religion goes. And uh, so he was being accused by the, this religious crowd, which is uh, just as crazy, if not crazier. And so he doesn't say anything. And religion bullies, and he's not going to be bullied. And so what he does, he just shuts his mouth. And by the way, he shuts his mouth, and you might say, that's rude. He doesn't respond to these people. No, uh, Jesus Christ still loves these people with an infinite amount of love, and he's going to demonstrate that on the cross and die as a substitute for them and for their sins. But he's not going to talk to them. Now, we are all uh, confused today about love in uh, this nation. And if you do not, uh, uh, if you do not uh, talk to somebody or if you do not say the right words, they might say, that person doesn't like me. Or if you don't uh, act too sociable, they'll say, this person doesn't like me. But that might not be the case at all. Uh, Jesus Christ loved these people, but he was using impersonal love. Uh, and he was not going to respond to them. And that means that we don't have to respond to those uh, people who are religious. They're always trying to trap you anyway. They're always trying to trap you with your own words, always trying to seek a time in which they can uh, run you down. So why even give them the opportunity? And that was Christ's attitude. They've, all, they've always uh, twisted his words, and they will continue to do so. So finally, he just cuts them off, says no more not dealing with these people anymore, mentally or physically. And that's what we have to do sometimes uh, around religious people, even in our own family. But uh, in your own family, of course, you don't have to go so far as to cut yourself off physically, but you do cut yourself off mentally. And even then, uh, they'll bring up religion, but all you do is keep your mouth shut, like Jesus Christ did. 
and, uh, and somebody may be in the tongues movement in your family and come over and well you they're in the family so you have to see them and you will have physical contact but when they start preaching to you and start telling you how you're wrong you can just keep your mouth shut but when they start to say something stupid you don't have to uh, say that's stupid and wrong no just shut up they're not going to listen to you anyway so just uh that's the way to keep peace, really, and that's true impersonal love. And uh, you can still love them and just keep your mouth shut and mentally separate. Because if you don't, you'll either get sucked into gossiping and judging them, or you'll end up following them one or the other. And you'll either end up compromising with them if you try to talk to them on the religious level, You'll either, if you're like Pontius Pilate and you have that weak character, you will compromise and uh, try to get along that way. And that's what Pontius Pilate's going to do, compromise with religious people, and it's going to get him in a heap of trouble. And you don't compromise with religious people. You just keep your mouth shut. And uh, on the other hand, if you react to them and uh, rip them apart verbally or right there in their face and get angry, well, you're in sin right there. So either way, it puts you in a precarious situation unless you simply separate as our Lord does. And he doesn't even, he, he stays perfectly silent. And perfect strength has the ability to stay perfectly silent even though they're accusing him of the most uh, dastardly of offenses. And he just doesn't even say a word. He ignores them. Therefore, this is a separation from religion, a very clear separation from religion that Jesus Christ wants all of us to see. And then in 27.13, Then Pilate said to him, Don't you hear how many charges they are bringing against you? Well, Pilate knows he's innocent. And he knows the religious crowd is uh, they're doing this all because of jealousy. But what strikes him most is the fact that he doesn't defend himself. He just stands there as the perfect Son of God without one word and accused of everything, accused of blasphemy, accused of uh, all sorts of uh, terrible things. And so Pilate says, don't you hear them? It's as if uh, Jesus is deaf, is what uh, Pilate is thinking. He doesn't understand this. But this is because it's spiritual and Pilate's an unbeliever. And this uh, spiritual power has to do with number seven and number eight, personal love for God and impersonal love for mankind. And that means that uh, he's able to handle these people. And uh, Pilate, being the wuss he is, he wants to cater to them. And he just can't believe that he just that Jesus just isn't going to open his mouth. 27.14, But he did not answer even one accusation. So that the procurator, and this is in the Greek, and this is how it comes out in the Greek, it's linear action sart, meaning he kept on, he kept on being greatly amazed. We're in 27.14. But he did not answer even one accusation, so that the procurator kept on being greatly amazed. And that's because, as I said, the Pontius Pilate knows that Jesus Christ is innocent. And most people would uh, be uh, almost cussing and uh, trying to convey their innocence. I'm innocent, blankety blank blank. And really make a forceful show of it. But not Jesus. He just kept his mouth shut. He knew he had to go to the cross anyway. And he wasn't going to get in a fight with the religious leaders. But he was going to go die as a substitute for them. So Pontius Pilate uh, saw a great strength of character in our Lord Jesus Christ. But Pontius Pilate himself didn't have a great strength of character. And knowing that Jesus Christ was innocent as the leader, he could have said, uh, this province is owned by Rome. This man is innocent. You will not touch him from here on out. I don't want to hear a word from you about this man from here on out. It's over. And bye-bye. And that would have been leadership. 
And that would have been a way to handle it. But he was, of course, uh, afraid of what Rome would do if the Jews went into revolt. And instead of standing by principle, if they would have fired him for this, so what? He was right. And you always do what's right. You stand on principle. If you don't stand on principle, you're a nothing. If you just waffle all around because of, of what people think and you waffle here and waffle there because of human pressure, you're a nothing. You don't have principle. I don't even understand people without principle and how they live their lives without any guide whatsoever. And principle, having principles from the Word of God is a way to uh, live your life happily. And you won't get enmeshed in all of this nonsense. But Pontius Pilate, an unbeliever, a brilliant unbeliever, uh, he thinks he can get out of this somehow. And, he, and, and instead of facing the issue, he is not, he's not going to face the issue. He's not going to believe in Christ, and he's not going to face the true issue here, and that is, is Jesus Christ guilty or innocent? And he's a judge, and that's how he's acting at this point. The procurators acted as judges. And the one good thing is he's impartial, but he's too weak to give out the order. A good judge would be impartial, and then, when it was all over, make a judgment. He's innocent. Leave him alone. And if you touch him, you'll be uh, you'll get you'll be in jail for manslaughter, etc. But that's not the way he acted because uh, he was in the most precarious position in his whole life, and uh, God knew that billions and billions of years ago, and He knew that Tiberius from Rome would appoint Pontius Pilate, and this is all part of God's plan. But he did not answer even one accusation so that the procurator kept on being greatly amazed. Linear action, Sark. He kept on being greatly amazed. Then in 2715, during the Passover feast, the procurator was accustomed to release one prisoner to the crowd, whomever they wanted. And if you've ever wondered why, why are the Jews taking him to Rome? Why didn't they just go ahead and stone him to death right there if that's the way they thought about it? Well, it was their holy days. No, there was no way. They can't stone anybody during the holy days. So they're going to stick to their religion. It's a holy day. We can't uh, kill him. So we'll take him. We'll swallow our pride and take him to a man we hate called Pontius Pilate and we'll have him do it. And we'll make sure he does it because we're going to bully him like we've bullied everybody our whole lives. And we're going to bully him with a crowd, a mob of people. And he's going to cave to that. And the religious people knew that was the only way they could get it, Pontius Pilate. Not directly, because both the religious people and Pontius Pilate hated each other vehemently. There was a natural hatred between Pontius Pilate and the religious crowd. So you notice how much they had to swallow their pride in going to Pontius Pilate. So the only way they're going to get him crucified right now during these holy days is for the Romans to do it. So they're trying to get the Romans to do it. And by the way, the Romans have an excellent judicial system. They had an excellent judicial system for 1,000 years straight. And that is a record. Well, it, outside of England, it's a record. England has had a wonderful judicial system for over a 1,000 years now. And uh, we have our judicial system. It's designed to be wonderful, but of course, degeneracy has ruined that. And uh, changing the legal system, if you say, we don't need jurors anymore because jurors are stupid, uh, doing that, all you'll get is a bunch of stupid uh, judges ruling instead. And you you can't imagine this. Well, you should be able to imagine the stupid judges that we have saying that you can't say the Pledge of Allegiance in school because it has under God. I mean, that's just ridiculous. So uh, when society is degenerate, you can't nothing every nothing's going to work. You can't put Humpty Dumpty back back together again until a pivot. Uh, only a pivot can do that, and that's what we need is a pivot. And then our judicial system will go back to working properly instead of letting the rich and famous go and all of that just because they're rich and famous. And we have a lot of problems in that area and a lot of unfairness now, not because of the way it was set up, 
but because there's degeneracy in society and people are stupid. They don't have any, the jurors are stupid. And uh, and the the system really, the only thing that uh, could be uh, done is maybe make it just mandatory for everyone to sit on a jury, and they do that, but then they have loopholes because you can say, I'm a racist, and they'll say, well, you're not on the jury then. And that's how you get out of jury duty. And so only the uh, the part of the class of the country that sits in jury duty oftentimes are people who don't have anything else to do anyway. They don't have a job or anything else, so they uh, have a bunch of stupid people ruling over the judicial system. When it is, it should be uh, part of, uh, I think, every uh, American civil duty to to do it. And if I were called up, I'd have to do it and uh, answer truthfully and not try to get out of it because uh, even though it doesn't pay that much, it's your responsibility to your country. And that is just the way it should be, and that would uh, help out a lot, but... Uh, not that much because half the country's already gone degenerate. I know that from the last election. At least 48% is extraordinarily degenerate. And as far as Christians go, uh, it's in the 90s percentile of degeneracy. Especially looking at the church signs lately, I just want to vomit. Just walk, just uh, driving down the street, church after church, have some stupid sign up, and you want to vomit. Or I do. You may not, but I do. Because it's so far off base with doctrine. It, it's just ridiculous. So dude, what are you doing teaching this stuff? But that's what happens during apostate times. So we see that Pilate was greatly amazed at the character of Jesus Christ, but he didn't have much character himself. And we see that uh, this is the Passover feast, so uh, this is why the Jews didn't do it themselves. They let the Romans uh, take over that responsibility. And this right here in 2715, we see a brilliant plan of Pontius Pilate. He's not going to face the issue, but he's going to, uh, he comes up with a brilliant plan that is born out of weakness. He's weak. He's weak as a ruler. And he thinks that he's come up with the plan that will solve it, that will keep his hands out of the mess. And it was his intention, and in making this brilliant plan, it was in his intention to release Christ. And in this way, he didn't have to have, he didn't have to face the true issue. Is he guilty or is he innocent? And he didn't want to face the true issue because if he had to face the true issue, then as an unbeliever, he would have to face the issue: Is he the Christ, the Son of God, or not? And he was on negative signals. It's not that he would have. It's not that he even rejected that he is. But he neglected it as an unbeliever because he didn't want to know. He was uh, too scared to figure it out, I guess. He didn't want to know about it. And it, it so upset him and his family, as we'll see in a moment. It even upset his wife a great deal. Yet they never came to the issue. Is he innocent or is he guilty? And if he would have faced the issue, he would have had to he would have had to believe in Jesus Christ because he would say he is innocent and he is the Son of God uh, because of what he said, etc. He didn't want to face that. And there's a lot of unbelievers like that that just don't want to face it. You may have witnessed to a few. I have witnessed to them, and then when uh, God, the Holy Spirit, starts revealing to them the truth, they get scared and say, I "Just I, I don't want to hear any more about that." Just stop talking about that, please. And I've seen that happen before. And it's sad, but it's all volition. And that is exactly what, how Pontius Pilate is dealing with this. He's having to come to a point where he has to either believe or not. He doesn't want to go through with that. He doesn't care about that. He wants to go on with his life and doesn't want to make a decision about this. So he simply comes up with a brilliant plan. He's going to show his uh, uh, his uh, how uh, benef- how beneficial he is, or bene- what do you call them, benefactors. 
He's going to be a benefactor to the Jews because uh, it is custom that they release one prisoner from the crowd. And he thought about that and said, this is how I'm going to get out of this tough situation. And and, and the reason why he came up with the plan, he wanted to release Christ. Instead of just saying, this man is innocent, release him. Uh, He's got to uh, please both sides. He's got to go politically expedient. And you can't please both sides. You never can. Never in in leadership can you please both sides. And I know our president wants to be a uniter and not a divider. But he's not the one dividing. It's the other side dividing. And you can't please certain people. And you can't please a, a, a political party that seeks your power. That's ridiculous. Stop trying to do that. Don't be expedient. And just uh, go with your principles. And there are principles. Our president has principles and he knows them. He wants to cut taxes. He wants to, which would bring, which is what capitalism is all about, by the way, having a low tax rate so people can earn their own money and keep it in their own pockets no matter how much they make. And just because you've uh, made a billion dollars like Bill Gates, instead of being taxed 39%, they should be taxed what everyone else is taxed. It's their money. And that's what capitalism says. Capitalism says it's your money, not the government's. And he believes that. But he has a hard time implementing that policy because he's always trying to be expedient and please both sides. And it's a, he has good intentions in doing it, but it doesn't work. They still hate his guts. They just see it as a sign of weakness. But I don't mean to get into politics, but this is just a, an analogy to show you how, how things work and how uh, this guy is working. Now, I like my president, by the way, and I really hate to even be any critical whatsoever, but I'm just trying to show you that there is, uh, when you're in the leadership position, you've got to be tough. And it just kind of shows the thinking of the American people. Uh, they've gotten way too soft. Not tough. We don't have that tough spirit anymore. And that, and that tough spirit comes from having principles. And when you have principles, you don't compromise. And if someone disagrees with you, well, you do what Jesus Christ did and you just shut up. Whatever. You're not going to change their minds. Certain things you just... uh, A good uh, thing that they had in the past was you never talk about uh, politics and religion in a social setting because it'll start a fight. And if you're in a social set, that that used to be the policy of this of uh, the culture years and years ago. That's changed now. Now everybody wants to talk about politics and religion, and uh, so a lot of people get in fights. And they have a what's the matter? And they have a an abnormal type of uh, almost a lust to debate, a lust to. Get at each other's throat, and that's just, uh, it's sinful, and it's, it's wrong, and the Bible talks about that as well. So it was the custom to release one prisoner to the crowd, whomever they wanted, so he came up with the plan. And at that time, they had in custody a notorious prisoner called Barabbas, or bar Abbas. That's how the Chaldeans said it. The Chaldeans said Bar Abbas. We we know him as Barabbas, but it's actually Bar Abbas, or whatever. He's still a creep, <laughs> and he is uh, actually the biggest gangster in Israel. He's a murderer, and the reason why Pontius Pilate brings out Bar Abbas is because he is trying to uh, have the most antithetical person on the other side. He wants this to be a sure thing that they're going to uh, that they will not pick Barabbas because he's a murderer, a notorious one, meaning a lot of people knew him. A lot of people, a lot of families have been affected by him as a real gangster and uh, notorious, meaning he was famous. It would be like it would be comparable today to Bonnie and Clyde. You say Bonnie and Clyde, everybody knows Bonnie and Clyde. Notorious, notorious criminals. 
He was like that, a notorious criminal. And he thought for sure uh, that this would be like Jeffrey Dahmer or something else. And he thought for sure that these religious people would not want Jeffrey Dahmer back out in society. He was wrong, but he thought this would he thought this was it. This would clinch it. And he would be and Jesus would be set free and that would be the end of it. So uh, Barabbas is put up against Jesus Christ. And uh, so this brings some uh, certainty to the mind of Pontius Pilate that they will say, release Jesus Christ because they don't want a murderer on the loose again. But uh, he didn't understand the hatred of religion toward grace. And he didn't because he didn't understand the spiritual significance of it all. He didn't understand so much of this, and he could have understood it, and he had the opportunity to understand it, but instead he became expedient. So just like it is difficult for uh, the rich to find salvation, maybe it's also difficult for the politician to find salvation. But that's not scriptural. You don't quote that, or don't even write it down. I just made it up. (laughs) 2717. So after they had assembled, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? And right there he's saying Jesus, who is called the Messiah, and he's not wanting to deal with the truth. He doesn't want to uh, he doesn't want to know himself whether he's the Messiah or not. He doesn't want to know, he doesn't care less. He's too interested in the things of the world right now. He's too interested in his power. Power lust keeps him from, uh, as so many other lusts in the unbeliever, keep them from coming to faith alone in Christ alone. We saw with Judas that it was money lust. He was always thinking about money this, money that, making money, stealing money, getting money, uh, betraying, tri- be- betraying Christ to get money, all sorts of ways to get money. And because he always had his mind on money, his heart became hard and he never believed in Christ. He did repent, we noted that, uh, on Friday, and that should be, or not Friday, Wednesday, and that should be up on the web pretty soon, and we noted what that repentance was. So I won't have to go over it, and if you weren't here, you can all you can listen on the internet tonight, hopefully, or whenever you feel like it. And then in 27, 18, for he knew that they had handed him over because of jealousy. Pontius Pilate knew these religious leaders. He knew what they were. He could see right through them. He was a brilliant man. He wasn't the normal numbskull that would uh, go around and see these religious people and say, Oh, good morning, Rabbi. And he would look at these people out on the corners praying and he would say, They're phony. They're doing this. Uh, He would just know they were phony. they, they, They were doing it for approbation lust. And he probably knew it because that's how he got ahead in life, through approbation lust. And uh, this is probably very true for Pontius Pilate. He got to where he was because he was a good, uh, uh, he was good with um, people. Good with a, a people pleaser, I guess you could say. Always able to get people to like him, and that's what you have to do in politics. And uh, especially in our system of politics, if you want to vote, they got to like you. So you have to, uh, uh, sometimes, uh, a lot of people throw principle right out the window for a vote. And uh, no, uh, this country is going to have a hard time ever having a, a great president like Ronald Reagan ever again because of the... Uh, because of the fact that people don't like straight talk, though they say they do, but they don't. Uh, in fact, people like to be lied to, it seems, and they like to be told all sorts of things as long as it's about lilies and bonnets and all types of nice things and peace and prosperity, etc. And as long as they hear that, well, I'm voting for that man. Sounds good. But Reagan came along, a man of principle, and he just happened to have a talent with eloquence in which he could take uh, a subject like a a, a boring subject like a tax cut and make it very interesting to the American people. 
He would just tell a story about it. He tell he would tell a story about when he was a young man and how he he asked for a raise from his father and then his father said, "Do you know, son, the government's taking ninety percent of my paycheck?" They did that back then, by the way, because his father was rich. And uh, as soon as the government gives me a tax cut, I will give you a uh, an allowance raise. And that made a big impression on Ronald Reagan because in 1960, John F. Kennedy was elected president and he pushed through a tax cut. Yes, the Democrat pushed through a tax cut. Go figure. But that was a different time and a different era. And John F. Kennedy pushed through a tax cut and as soon as he did that, Ronald Reagan got his allowance raised. And he said, yeah, man, I like this. And so he would tell that as president to try to convey a point that tax cuts are good. And uh, all the people would be so enamored with his story, and they would say, that makes sense to me. Bring it on. And so then, uh, even though Congress was Democrat, they all voted for the tax cut, because if they didn't, they knew it would be their hide. They had to become expedient. And they they actually crossed over the... If there was ever a uniter, it would have been Ronald Reagan. And and he stood by principle. He just had the talent to do it. A a unique man, and probably won't see him in my lifetime ever again, another man like it, uh, running for office anyway. Just completely unique in, in every way in terms of politics. But I'm getting off the subject. And that's because of that's because of Pontius Pilate. Blame him. <clears throat> so he knew that they were jealous, and so he came up with this brilliant plan that's not going to work. Twenty seven nineteen. As he was sitting on the judgment seat, and that is, that is his seat of uh, judgment, meaning he's a judge. His wife sent a message to him. Do not condemn that innocent man. And by sending the message, she didn't run up to him. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're the procurator, and he's, she's the wife, so she just sends a message, and some little dude runs and gives it to him, and that's his job. And so he gets this message in the middle of this uh, trial, and he reads this. Do not condemn that innocent man, because I have suffered greatly as a result of a dream about him today. Now, the Romans were uh, really into seances. They were really into a lot of demon activity. All of the, uh, the world outside of Judea was really interested in seances, and they worshipped other gods and all that, and they were interested in uh, con- connecting with the dead, etc. And so she had contact with the demon world, apparently, and she went into a trance. And apparently she got some good information in that trance with her connections to the demon world. And the demon world uh, knew that Christ was going to go to the cross. And uh, they wanted to, they didn't, they were, actually, the demon world did not want Christ to go to the cross because if he would not go, then there would be nothing to believe in. And so she says uh, the demon world got a hold of her and said, hey, send this um, uh, message. Don't you better not do anything to this man, and that's apparently what happened. So don't say. Uh, so she sent him this message, but not even this message uh, uh, terrifies him enough to stop being expedient. It should have, but it didn't. But the chief priest and elders persuaded the mob, and that's what broke Pontius Pilate. It wasn't the religious crowd; it was the mob. And he just allowed mob rule. And you never allow mob rule as a leader. You never allow people to pillage New Orleans as a leader. You go out like uh, the Napoleon Bonaparte and you uh, kill a couple hundred of them and then all of a sudden the looting and the rioting stops and the mob disperses because they're cowards. And when you go to college, they'll teach about, I went there, by the way, and they taught about Napoleon Bonaparte, and they trashed him. See, he was such an arrogant man for blowing away that crowd. If he hadn't blown away that crowd, France would not exist today, which might not be a bad thing, but (laughs) France would have starved to death because they were... Uh, rioting all the time and the mobs were stealing food and stealing everything. There was no rule of law and within a couple of months 
France would have been would have destroyed itself completely. Completely destroyed itself. And uh, yet this college professor said Napoleon Bonaparte was arrogant. Napoleon Bonaparte, by killing a hundred hoodlums, saved France. And you'll hear a lot of idiocy in college. That's why you need to stick with doctrine so that, uh, you, so that you won't get sucked into that garbage, that crap. And there's a lot of it. And oh man, is there a lot of it. It's worse now than it's ever been. And uh, they're, they're going to try to persuade you to believe all sorts of weird stuff. And most young people go for it because they have no principles and no doctrine. So they fall for it. And then their parents uh, wonder why why is this why is my son voting for this idiot? And that happened a lot uh, last round. The parents uh, uh, were torn apart because a lot of their children had gone to college and started uh, the, and the college indoctrinated them and they just uh, they just couldn't imagine that they would uh, split with them on a vote. You know, they're their little kid. They do you know, they're supposed to do this and this and well, it, it caused a lot of problems, but that's uh, college for you. It can cause a lot of problems, and not a panacea, by, a way, by the way. And just because you go to college doesn't even guarantee you a job. It might guarantee you a higher position, and it, it, it's a good thing to do if that's what you want to pursue. But remember, if you join the military, you get to go to college for free afterwards, and then you have some discipline. Anyway, I'm getting off subject. <laughs> But the chief priest and the elders persuaded the mob to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The principle out of this is you must follow the rule of law. You can't follow what a mob says. And just because mobs run around and, and say one thing doesn't mean the government has to do what they say. And then in the 60s, mob rule about destroyed this country. 60s and early 70s. A bunch of hippies running around, dictating policy, and Nixon, he's dead now so I can talk about him. Nixon, he buckled to the mob, just like Pontius Pilate. A bunch of hippies running around because he came up with a plan. He said, you know what? Uh, I'm going to end this war right here and now I'm going to nuke the place. And the public caught wind of that and the hippies went crazy. And then hundreds and thousands of hippies went to Washington, D.C. and marched around. And Nixon got scared and followed the mob. He became expedient. And so instead of nuking them, which was a wonderful idea, he simply pulls out the troops. And then millions upon millions of people die as a result. Not only in Vietnam, but in Cambodia. And uh, that's what happens when expediency uh, takes over principle. And he should have stuck to his principles. And he should have said, I'm right, they're wrong. I don't care how many of them are out there. If it were me, I'd go out and just say, I'm nuking them right now. It's in the air. They're on the way. <laughs> And that would be the end of it. And boom, it would happen and the mobs would disperse. And that would be the end of the war and uh, millions of people would get killed except this time it would be the right people getting killed and not the wrong people. So you must go by the rule of law and not by mob rule. We haven't had so much of that lately. That's a good sign. But uh, New Orleans was, I guess, uh, an example of it. But we... Uh, we seem to move uh, a little bit away from that, at least for now. It can happen, though, at any moment, at any time. History can uh, change very quickly. So uh, the procurator asked them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And they actually kept on saying it. And uh, Pilate said to them, and he, this shocked him, by the way. Took him aback. They couldn't believe they had so much hate for the man. So they, so he says very uh, naively, "Then what should I do with Jesus?" 
And then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? And they all kept on saying, linear action, Sark, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, over and over again, a huge mob. And it was loud, and it scared Pontius. This, this huge mob broke his will, and he saw all of this hatred, and he knew Jesus Christ was innocent. So he's really having a, a battle with himself right now. And uh, just to look at how much uh, religion can bring up so much hate. And that's what religion is. Uh, religion pulls up a lot of hate, a lot of the sin nature, the worst part of the sin nature. Religion taps into the worst parts of the sin nature. That part that is very arrogant and very easy to hide and it, it's very easy to hide from themselves. They don't even they think they are perfectly righteous in what they are doing. And every time they say crucify him, they feel even more righteous. They don't have any remorse. They feel great. Crucify him. And they have no grace attitude. They don't understand grace. They have not believed in Christ. And they want to see him crucified. And as I uh, told you, the Jews didn't stone him themselves because it was a holy day. And that would go on for eight days during the Passover. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.